The Holy Gospel according to St. John. After he appeared to his followers in Jerusalem, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got on the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, do you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? More than these. He said to them, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, Do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands And someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The gospel of the Lord. So here we have another great morning filled with some really powerful, powerful Bible readings. Jesus getting a hold of two major characters in Scripture in the New Testament. Peter, down by the lake, and then Paul. In two different ways, but with the same result. Calling them to serve God's people. This morning... I want to take a minute and focus in on our first reading that Paul was reading us from the book of Acts. Part of my own interest in Paul's encounter with the risen Jesus in Damascus is that I've never really had that sort of experience in my own life. I was baptized when I was less than a month old, and there's never been a time when I haven't been a Christian I was one of those kids that was always pretty much up at the church all the time. 
Anytime there were choirs, youth groups, Sunday school, worship, or anything else, I was around. That was pretty much what my family did when I was growing up. Now, there's something to be said for that, for the ways in which my parents were so insistent on keeping the promises that they made when I was baptized. But when I hear stories like Paul's, where his faith life took a significant change, I have to admit to you that I get a little bit of a complex. Is my faith somehow inferior, for instance, Because I've never had Jesus strike me to the ground asking questions of me? Is my faith somehow less than others? Because I've never had a Damascus Road type of experience. I worry about that sometimes. Whatever your story is, if you've never had a Damascus Road experience like me, or if you have... I'm sure there are some folks here who can attest to that. What these stories have in common is the sense that God is being busy. God is at work in all of our lives. Now, we Lutherans don't generally use the word conversion all that often in our vocabulary. Part of that has to do with our history. Some 500 years ago, when Lutheranism got a hold in Europe, and then later in places like this part of Texas, when our German ancestors came over on the boat and then came up here to San Antonio, the assumption was that everyone that was living around us was a Christian, and that non-Christians lived far away in places that were far, far away from places like Helotus in San Antonio. Now, of course, anyone that's been paying attention to demographics and knowing what's going on here in our country right now knows that that has not been the case for a long, long time. This means that it's safe for us to assume that people that come walking through these doors here at Zion will not know anything about Lutheranism or even Christianity. So, we Lutherans, I think, have some work to do in recognizing how God's Spirit continues to get a hold of people and bring them to faith. A starting point for us might be our own sinfulness. We Lutherans know a lot about sin. A lot of our worship services start with confession and forgiveness, a rather bleak way to start things by us admitting that we certainly haven't lived up to what it means to be a Christian. We have all been stubborn, we have all been selfish, and we have all been caught up in things that we haven't been proud of. That's what we say when we come together for confession. And at the same time, when we come together to confess our sins and to hear God's word of forgiveness, part of what we remember is that God is busy at work in our lives, chipping away at those sorts of things that we wouldn't be proud of. To take the sin, to take those things that don't show the love of God and convert us into the people that God is calling us to be. Now, sometimes that happens in a really dramatic fashion. And sometimes that happens in some very, very subtle ways. The point is this. As Christians, we are always, always, always under construction. When I meet with people that are considering baptism for their child or for themselves, I will tell them that baptism is a lot like an event and a relationship. And to get to that, I talk about the difference between a wedding and a marriage. If you're married, you can point to a day when your wedding was, the day in which you said, I do. And that was a day full of joy. But your wedding day 
is not the end of the story. Because long after the dress is put in storage and long after the tuxedos are returned back to the store, there's a marriage that has to be lived out. And so it is in our own baptism. When we are baptized, like Maya was this morning, whether it be as an infant or as an adult after a Damascus Road experience or some other experience, Know that the day that you were baptized was not the end of your story in God's love and grace. It was only the beginning. We can point to a day, an event. Maya, for the rest of her life, can point to April 10th, 2016 and say, that was the day that I was baptized. But baptism also means a relationship both with God and with God's people. And because this is a relationship with God's people, conversion, baptism, and this new life that God is constantly inviting us into isn't just a me and Jesus sort of thing. Paul, one of the central people in the entire New Testament, isn't just left to his own after he has his Damascus Road experience. There's this minor but important character in the story, a man by the name of Ananias, that Jesus uses to come and to heal Paul. Now, Ananias doesn't exactly go to Jesus willy-nilly. He has every reason to be concerned about going to meet the newly converted Saul. After all, just a few chapters ago, Saul was overseeing the killing of Stephen, who was daring to follow and to speak in the name of Jesus. But for some reason, Ananias puts his trust in God, and God uses him to bring about Saul's healing. So much so that when Ananias goes to greet Saul, his first words to him are, Brother Saul, not as an opponent or an enemy, but as a brother. We will hear a lot more about Paul all throughout the rest of the New Testament. And his impact shapes who we are as God's people today. Our own part of the Christian tradition, Lutheranism, is in fact deeply shaped by what Paul did and said to churches after his Damascus Road experience. But the funny thing to me is that the only other time that we'll hear about Ananias in the New Testament is when Paul speaks about his Damascus Road experience later on in the book of Acts. That's it. Ananias is a minor character in the Bible, and yet he is an important one. I think that's where most of our stories are as well. For every Mother Teresa, for every Billy Graham, Martin Luther King Jr., or Martin Luther, there are myriads of myriads of saints that have lived their lives in the joy and love of the gospel. So all that's to say that probably most of us, if not all of us here in this room, won't be quoted in the history books when it comes to our Christian story. But even with that said, that doesn't mean that we don't have an important job to do in the here and now. In our baptism, we were all given a name, the same name that Paul was given, beloved child of God. Ananias doesn't let fear get in the way of what God is calling him to do. There are a great number of things that we could be afraid or angry about right now. What's up with this funk in our country right now? Where are all these people going to live that are moving to our part of San Antonio? Or here at Zion, what's going on in the sanctuary? 
Will we have enough money to pay for all this construction? But if we are to follow in the way of Ananias, and really in the way of all of God's saints, we have this calling to put aside our fears and to trust, to quote the old hymn, that this is my father's world. If I had written my sermon any earlier in the week, I would have asked that we would have sung that hymn, This is My Father's World. But since we don't have our hymnals down here, and since I settled on this conclusion at four o'clock yesterday, I'll quote the last verse of the hymn. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me not forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king. Let heaven ring. God reigns. Let the earth be glad. Even though there is so much that is wrong in me and in this world, fear not. Because God is busy converting this entire world into life. Amen.